This is it, the final episode of the Plants vs Zombies 2 one seed slot journey. Jurassic Marsh, Big Wave Beach, and Modern Day are all that lie ahead. Are you excited? I know I am. Four months of hard work will all culminate in today's episode, as we'll uncover the exact percentage of the game's levels that are possible with one seed slot. Make sure you watch until the end. In case you're living under a rock, P. This is the fourth and final installment of the series. In the very first episode, I went over all the rules and I recommend watching the episodes in chronological order. Or, if you just want to see me get my brains munched on in the hardest levels in the game, then by all means watch this video right now. Oh yeah, and if I sound a little weird it's because I'm sick. Yeah, I know, great timing, just as I'm about to record one of my biggest videos, that's just my luck. Anyway, let's get started. Day 7 is still impossible due to the toxic combination of the conveyor belt and the flowers. Day 8 was possible with the extremely powerful Primal Pea Shooter. Day 9 introduced a serious challenge with the Pterodactyls. The Pterodactyls are basically a complete counter to this challenge, since they drag zombies to the other end of the lawn. This allows the zombies to shut down any strategies involving Red Stinger and Primal Pea Shooter. In case you aren't aware, these plants absolutely carry the whole run. So this is an extremely big deal. So what did I do about the Pterodactyls? I dug up my plants. Yes, as counterintuitive as digging up your very finite plant sounds, it's the best and only thing you can do to react to the pterodactyls. By digging up the plants in that row, you get half your sun back, and you let this backwards zombie walk back the way they came. Primal Pea Shooter's plant food ability is just about the only other way to deal with this conundrum. By mixing these two strategies, I managed to get through day 9. But not day 10. There were just too many zombies to handle, the pterodactyls certainly didn't help either. With lots of digging up red stingers to counter the pterodactyls and, admittedly, a lot of lawnmowers, day 11 wasn't too bad. Neither was day 12. In fact, day 12's gimmick of forcing us to have little plants on the board is an example of a gimmick that actually helps us in this challenge. It means that the levels are designed for you to have less plants on the lawn, which is what happens to us in a challenge whether we like it or not. This makes these levels actually somewhat nice. Day 13 and 14 gave us a nice break from the pterodactyl spam, which was great, both for my sanity and for making these levels possible. In day 15 I used Red Stinger to protect the primal walnuts, which worked out well. For some reason I don't have any footage of day 16, but I wrote in my notes that it was impossible because there were simply too many zombies, so you'll have to take my word for that one. Day 17 was just another playground for primal pea shooter to do with magic. Day 18 was impossible largely thanks to the T-Rexes. Since I can't use any stalling plants or insta-kills, there's nothing I can do to stop them. What am I even meant to do about this? So a T-Rex popping up means game over for that lane. At least we have one lawnmower before this would actually mean the level is lost. Day 19 gave us Cold Snapdragon, one of the most overpowered plants in the game. Needless to say, this level was possible. Take that, flowers. Day 20 was immediately impossible since it was a Produce X Sun level. Day 21 was just peak level design. Watch this. My notes for this level really say it all. Even if you ignore the crazy T-Rex buckethead spam, the bully zombies are a massive problem since, even given the whole lawn, Primal P can't even kill them. They're that tanky. Day 22 was a last stand level that was initially impossible. Don't worry, we'll be replacing these measly potato mines with something far more dangerous very soon. Day 23 was impossible thanks, again, to the chaotic and fast-paced dinosaur and zombie spam seen commonly in part 2 of the Jurassic Marsh. But hey, at least we unlocked Primal Potato Mines, so we can go back and absolutely annihilate Day 22. Day 24 and 25 were the same as Day 23. Just too much stuff. We were also introduced to the Ankylosaurus who's just... do I really need to explain? Again, I think my notes explain these levels pretty well. Day 26 was torture thanks largely to the duo of mold and dinosaurs. Just the sight of this will keep me up at night. Day 27 was another last stand level, you already know how we beat it. After the breath of fresh air from day 27, it was back to torture. Day 28 was the same old impossible dinosaur spam level. Day 29 was close, I could consistently get to the final wave, but no further. Day 30 was no different. Also, nice one, Popcap. Day 31 was a complete joke with Cold Snapdragon. And now we find ourselves at the Jurassic Marsh Zomboss fight. 
To say that it was anticlimactic is an understatement. The fact that the primal pea shooters can't stun the slightly bulky zombie, but can stun this massive robotic dinosaur is really funny, but also really useful making the boss fight a piece of cake. In total, Jurassic Marsh had 19 possible levels and 13 impossible levels. The majority of the impossible levels came from the second half of the world, which isn't surprising considering the dinosaurs it introduced and the ramp up in difficulty. So I beat days 1 to 4 again, forgetting that I'd already done that in the first episode. That was a waste of time. Day 5 was impossible since I just couldn't make it past the last wave. Day 6 was easy with Primal Pea Shooter. Day 7 emphasized the major issue with Big Wave Beach in this challenge, the lack of lily pads. In this level, the tide can creep up the whole lawn, meaning that I need to protect every plant with a lily pad. The problem is that we can only use the pre-planted lily pads, of which are only about one per lane, and they're scattered around the middle of the lanes too. Definitely not ideal. So I decided to try Rotobugger, a plant which is supposedly good at dealing with Big Wave Beach due to its ability to hover above water without a lily pad. Supposedly being the key word here, at least for this challenge. The Rotos couldn't handle all the tanky bucket heads and such, allowing them to shred through the finite defenses. This isn't to mention the snorkel zombies who are basically impossible to deal with. Needless to say, day 7 was impossible. Day 8 was impossible largely due to how quickly the conveyor belt filled up with junk. The level would constantly throw zombies in all 5 lanes, so I couldn't discard the unnecessary bowling balls since they would hit zombies interacting with the level, which obviously we don't want. I came close to beating day 9 with Colonel Pool to no avail. I tried using Snapdragon, but oddly enough they can't damage the snorkelers, despite the fact that they can detect them and even try breathing fire on them. For the record, Roto failed again. I couldn't beat the level with any of these plants. My first impressions with day 10 were grim. Conveyor belt level with Bowling Bulb? I immediately thought this was a lost cause. Surprisingly though, Bowling Bulb managed to deal with the level fairly well. Day 11 was another success story, except this time with Primal Pea Shooter. Same for day 12, where the primal pea shooters held back the copious amounts of zombies until the lawnmowers could sweep them all up after the final wave. Primal pea shooter and lawnmowers are a match made in heaven. Day 13 was a produce X sun level, impossible. Day 14 gave me another jump scare, another level that forces bowling bulb except this time it was locked and loaded level. But just like day 10, bowling bulb surprised me and we managed to beat the level with it. I tried a bunch of plants for day 15, but couldn't find a solution. I will say though, as impossible as it is for this challenge, I really like this level's design and gimmick. Day 16 is infamous for being probably the hardest level in the game. It definitely lived up to its infamy. The furthest we managed to make it through the level was about 3 quarters. Day 17 was another primal pea shooter success, but the level introduced a zombie we don't speak of. Day 18 was close, but possible with Glockadile. Thanks, lawnmowers. Day 19 was okay until the Octo Zombies started showing up at the end of the level, deeming it impossible. Day 20 wasn't even close. This is what the start of the level looked like. Day 21 was a unique, fun level, and more importantly, possible with just homing thistle. Day 22 was impossible, mostly because of one zombie. Probably the most annoying zombie for this challenge. None other than Bikini Zombie. Okay, we all know it's Fisherman Zombie. It takes blood, sweat, and tears to get each and every plant onto the lawn in this challenge, only for this goofy looking fisherman to drag them into the tide. And you know what's better than Fisherman Zombie? Fisherman Zombie and Octo Zombie. Double the misery. If it weren't for the endangered banana launches in Day 23, the level would have been another victim of Fisherman Zombie. But it ended up being possible by shooting down all the fishermen with banana missiles. Day 24 was another bowling bulb level, impossible for the same reasons as day 8. Day 25 was just too overwhelming, it basically threw everything bad from this world at once. In day 26 nothing was ever getting past all these banana launches. Day 27 was an impossible joke, where do I put my bloody plants? Day 28 was going well, until it wasn't. Again, this level was just all of Big Wave Beach's excrement wrapped up into one insulting package. Day 29, however, was possible with just a few banana launches at that. 
Thank God the gargantuan at the end of the level spawned in the one lane with a lawnmower left. Rather than explaining why day 30 was impossible, I'll just show you this clip. Day 31 ended up being absolutely possible, a massive turnaround from the last level, albeit with just one homing thistle left by the end of the level. Day 32 was reminiscent of past Zomboss battles. This was because all the plants the conveyor belt gives are both of low percentages and low maximums. What this means is that the one plant I choose to work with will come extremely rarely on the conveyor and be limited to only a few of them on the lawn at a time. Basically, this makes the level impossible no matter which plant I choose from the distributed plants. Overall, 16 out of 32 levels in Big Wave Beach were possible, exactly half. All things considered, I'm pleased with this result. This is known to be the hardest world in the game after all, and I beat half of it with just one seed slot and no infinites or lily pads. In the first episode, I thought day 2 was impossible. Obviously, I would forgotten to try it with Red Stinger, who annihilated the level. Day 3 was possible with Lightning Reed, something I didn't expect since the whole level was designed around using Shrinking Violet to make Lightning Reed's damage output actually bearable. Day 4 was possible with Primal Pea Shooter, the GOAT. Day 5 was possible with Nightshade, using the digging up and replanting maneuvers which I've used before to make this plant work very well. Day 6 was a Produce X Sun level, our first truly impossible level of modern day. Just as appeared in Day 7 through Dark Ages portals, severely reducing our plant options. The furthest I could make it was the final wave with Lightning Reed. There was no beating all these breakdancers and octo zombies though. Day 8 was our first Begooled level. For these types of levels, we're only allowed to upgrade one plant once. I chose to upgrade Snapdragon to Cold Snapdragon. Either way, this didn't make much of a difference, the level was super easy. I tried beating Day 9 with Nightshades, but the Explorer Zombie proved to be a challenge. However, I found a solution to this. By placing the first Nightshade and letting it get burnt up, you can plant a second Nightshade on the Explorer Zombie's body, just as the Torch's hitbox passes the tile, letting the second Nightshade stay on the lawn without getting burnt up after defeating the Explorer. This technique resulted in a close call. But sadly, the level never ended up being possible. This is largely due to the wall of speedy balloon zombies in the final wave who require two nightshades to handle. Day 10 featured a full on far future assault. Even two columns of snapdragons couldn't hold off the copious amounts of tanky mechs. For day 11, I was completely invested in trying to win with only shadow shrooms. I'm not exaggerating when I say I was trying this for hours simply because I was too stubborn to switch up my strategy. The Shadow Shrooms would actually work through the whole level until the very end, where the football mechs would just be too tanky to survive two of their plant food abilities. That was a bummer, so I tried with a Red Stinger. And the last wave of football mechs were still too tanky. Then I tried with Colonel Pult, and success. Man, I love how you can just permanently stool zombies with this plant. For day 12 we faced a bit of a dilemma. The level featured a return of the combo of Excavator and Parasol Zombies. Well, couldn't we just use Snapdragon like we used for most of Lost City? Nope. Popcap had two steps ahead of us. In case you didn't know, these little fellas aren't just unique for their adorable little dragon outfits, they're also immune to fire attacks. For us, this means we need to use a plant that deals damage that doesn't shoot straight projectiles, lobbing projectiles, or fire damage. Oh, and it has to be a world plant, remember. Premiums are banned in this run. Needless to say, our options are very, very limited here. I could think of one plant we could use though, Lightning Reed. It doesn't have the most reliable damage output and its hit detection around the excavator's shovel can be sketchy at times, but we'll have to make it work. Or not. Yeah, after all of that, Lightning Reed can't even beat the level. That's mainly because of the dinosaurs. Oh yeah, if you didn't already think this level was toxic enough with that trio of restricting zombies, it also throws dinosaurs into the mix to add insult to injury. As much as I hate to say it, we didn't get to teach this level a lesson. Day 13 was another Begooled level. This level was more than a welcome after the chaotic level we just grappled with. The plan I decided to upgrade was Cabbage Pult into Melon Pult. The level was a breeze. 
For day 14, I picked Nightshade and swept through the level until... Yeah, I learned a valuable lesson there. Save the plant food for the Gargantua. So that's what I did on the next attempt. In fact, I was so focused on a Gargantua this time that I somehow missed this brown coat in the bottom lane and lost the level again. This is peak Plants vs Zombies 2 gameplay. Third time's a charm. Day 15 was impossible simply due to the amount of zombie spam on the endangered walnuts. There was no stopping all these imps. Day 16, our last Gargantua battle. And it was a very fitting one at that. The, the level's conveyor has a weird gimmick where it constantly changes as the level progresses. In fact, there are 16 plants in total throughout the level. I've just now realised that's probably an easter egg, hinting towards the fact that it's the Day 16 Gargantua fight. I don't know if that's an intentional reference, but what I do know is that the level's conveyor belt always starts with Winter Melon. Winter Melon is a nice plant and all, but after placing a few of them down, the conveyor belt switches up and we can't plant anything for the rest of the level. Just as a reminder, the whole damn level is made up of Gargantuas. Yeah, no matter how good Winter Melon is, there was no holding off a whole level of gargs with just 5 of them. Day 17, the first level of Modern Day Part 2. And much like the rest of the game's part 2 introductory levels, this one is absolutely possible with one seed slot. I used Nightshade and to deal with arcade zombies, I placed the Nightshades on top of them right after they pushed the arcade machines like so. For day 18, I tried a bunch of plants and nothing worked. The balloon zombies and zombie bulls were simply too fast and tanky. In day 19, I tried using escape route from the conveyor belt. That worked out exactly how you'd expect. Primal Pea Shooter ended up saving the day though. Day 20 was impossible but very close. Funnily enough, I found Split Pea useful for this level due to all the Prospector zombies. Day 21 was a tough one, but all star zombies are really annoying to deal with without wall plants or enough seed slots to sacrifice a cheap plant to stop their charge. We could have tried using Nightshade, but the level drops MC zombies right on top of our plants. Day 22 was another Begul level. Thank god. It was an easy victory. We could make it to the final wave of day 23, but then the last wave would always overcome the red stingers. Why? I think, again, my notes for this level really say it all. Day 24 was annoying since it just sent a bunch of all-stars until one of them got through the defences, making the level impossible. Day 25 was a huge relief since, well, I could just play it as normal. Yes, at last, a level with only one plant to begin with, that plant being Intensive Carrot. This is a fun and memorable level, but above all else, it's certainly possible too. Day 26 on the other hand was impossible. I think by now we've reached that point as with Big Wave Beach and Jurassic Marsh where the second half of the world just falls to complete insanity and levels become impossible just because of the sheer amount of strong zombies. I mean, dinosaurs, mechs, all-stars, newspapers, hair metal gargantuas, there's no stopping this onslaught no matter which plant we choose. And just as I was starting to lose all hope, another Begold level comes to ease the pain. Much like all the other Begold levels, this one is more than possible. And for day 28... Well, that was anticlimactic. And with day 29, we return to the chaotic formula I was discussing earlier. This level starts up too impossibly fast, the gravestones eliminating any hope for Red Stinger 2. I think it's pretty self-explanatory why day 30 was impossible. Just watch this clip of the start of the level. Something I've noticed with all the day 31s is that they're all made to show off the world's part 2 premium plant. And for that reason, they're all super easy. I guess this, this is to prove a point like PopCap saying, hey look, this is meant to be a really hard end of the world level. But since the premium plant is given to you, it's really easy. Look how good the premium plant is. Well, that's not the case. It's just that these levels are designed to be easy to artificially inflate the capabilities of the premium plant to entice you to buy them, as I was saying. With this in mind, it's no surprise that the last non-boss fight level of the whole game, the one you'd think would be the toughest regular level, ended up relatively easy. With some nightshades, Mon Day Day 31 was done. Now we're on the final stretch, the final three levels of the game, all boss fights too. Let's give it a shot, shall we? As you probably know, each of these levels has 3 or 4 different levels they could be, given at random each time you attempt the level. 
Rather than going over all the instances of each level, I'll just go over the variation that I came closest to beating, or beat. Starting with Day 32, the closest one to being possible being the Wild West variation. This level just spawns so many minecart heads, it's actually insane. My strategy was to use citrons and use their plant food ability to sweep away all the minecart heads. The only problem is, at most, the conveyor let me have two citrons down at one time. On top of this, I would rarely get enough plant food to keep up with all of the extremely tanky zombies. This level is and was impossible and will never be possible. As for day 33, I found the far future iteration to be the most conceivable. Clearly I wasn't mistaken as I beat it literally first try. Then I realized... I forgot the power tiles of their own seed slots in this level. Well great, there's no way the level would be possible without power tile. <coughs> Yup, I redid the whole thing without the help of a single power tile. Fume Shroom is just too good, especially its plant food ability. Day 34 had four different versions. I made it the furthest in the Neon Mixtape Tour variation. It's fitting that the plant responsible for this was no other than Primal Pea Shooter. I run before my horse to market though, we didn't actually beat the level. In fact, we didn't even get past Zomboss's punk phase. At least Primal Pea Shooter showed off his strength in some way for the final level of the run. For modern day, 16 levels were possible, while 18 were impossible. This is the only world apart from Dark Ages to have a possible level rate of below 50%, which does make sense since it's the final world. To be honest though, when I first started this challenge, I honestly thought that there would be no levels possible in modern day, and to think that 16 of them are possible, that's just wow. We've really come a long way. So, that's it. Actually, a lot of you were telling me I should go out of world order and go back to beat previous levels with my new and powerful plants, while also beating levels I previously deemed impossible. Sadly though, there was only one successful instance of this advice. Thanks to Danny Cheezitz for telling me to go back to Neon Mixtape Tour Day 10, where we were able to stall the whole level of zombies until the end using Time Warp. This resulted in an extremely satisfying Lawnmower Massacre, reminiscent of Frostbite Cave's Day 3 from earlier in the series. Some of you were telling me to go back to the Dark Ages too and attempt those soft-locked levels with Primal Potato Mine to destroy the Sun Graves to kickstart the levels. Obviously, Primal Potato Mine is a plant that's less than 75 sun, and it can deal damage to gravestones upon exploding. So, what was the problem with this? Well, understandably, this didn't work out since Primal Potato Mine's recharge is way too long to deal with all the zombies at those levels. I did try though, and it was working to an extent, but I couldn't beat any levels with it. Also, I thought it would be cool to go over a holistic view of the challenge's results. To do so, I made this bar graph. This measures the percentage of possible levels for each world on the y-axis. I'm no rocket scientist, but I can see a pretty concise negative trend here. I find it interesting that, excluding the obvious outlier, this could be a pretty decent measure of how difficult each world is comparatively. It's interesting to note that after Frostbite Caves, the percentage of possible levels actually goes back up a bit with Lost City and Far Future. Far Future even pops back up to the same percentage as Wild West. Then Dark Ages obviously falls all the way down, followed by a nice and clear decline in percentages for the rest of the worlds until modern day. Before I bore you to death with stats, let's go on to the main act. The amount of possible levels with one seed slot in the whole of Plants vs Zombies 2. The whole challenge has been leading up to this. Drum roll, please. 214 out of 312 levels. That is a grand total of 69%, rounded to the nearest percentage. I couldn't have asked for a better result. So, what has this journey taught us? Plants vs Zombies 2 is a game all about synergy and combining plants to create new unique strategies to respond to each level. Well, if 8 seed slots didn't already make that obvious. So therefore, I conclude that doing this challenge was torture, but fun torture nonetheless, and successful torture. But the spirit of this challenge isn't over. I could have missed some levels or just been bad at the game, 
So now this challenge is in your hands. Yes, you. Who knows, maybe a bunch more levels are possible. If you have the balls to try the levels I couldn't beat, then by all means, go ahead, prove me wrong. Although I hope you don't, because that'll probably ruin the funny number. <laughs>